Hey, everybody, what's up? I'm just going to post this interview that I did with Megan Day, great writer, staff writer at Jacobin Magazine. I did this interview with her in the summer of 2019, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, but it was all about means testing versus universal programs. And I thought today would be a good day to republish that or put it on YouTube, at least, um, because Politico story just came out. House Democrats settle income debate for direct payments. Um, and so the news that broke today, first paragraph of the article, House Democrats will move ahead with coronavirus stimulus package that would keep the existing income limits for Americans who receive stimulus checks while tightening eligibility for higher earning Americans, a major win for progressives. So basically what they're doing is they are keeping the threshold to determine whether or not an individual or a household gets stimulus payments these $1,400 checks that were supposed to be $2,000 checks, but that's a different conversation uh, for individuals that's 75,000 a year and for households that's 150,000 per year. Now that is means tested in itself. And I don't think these payments should be means tested at all. Um, but this is certainly better than what some of the moderates were proposing, which is lowering that threshold to $50,000 a year for an individual, $100,000 a year for a household. Now, the thing that's absurd about this, even at the current level that it's at, 75,000, is that for a lot of these payments, they're going to be based off of 2019 tax returns, which was pre-pandemic. So, you know, I mean, if you own a restaurant in New York City, you could have made a quarter million dollars in 2019 and made nothing in 2020 and can be in dire straits now, right? So that's why I don't think this should be means tested at all, but that's why I wanted to republish this interview. This was a great interview. Uh, Megan had written an article that was uh, entitled, Why We Need Free College for Everyone, Even Rich People. And so the context within uh, what which uh, this interview takes place um, is around the tuition-free college issue, but we don't really get that into specifics about the college issue itself. It's more just a general argument um, against means testing programs uh, of any kind, whether it's stimulus now or health care or tuition, uh, things like that. Um, she makes four basic points um, that really puncture a hole in the whole centrist scam that is means testing theory. Um, and so the interview is in audio form because at the time we recorded it, we didn't have a YouTube channel. So it's an audio interview only. So you can watch it here on YouTube. I'm going to play it for you right now. Or you can go subscribe to the podcast um, and get it on any podcast player. This is episode 20 of the podcast. So over 80 episodes ago, one of the first shows we did, but I think it holds up. It's, it's kind of evergreen. I think it's one of the best episodes we ever did. Um, like I said, she lays out these arguments uh, very, very well. And I think it's really, really uh, a useful thing to listen to. So I think you guys will enjoy it quite a bit. Thank you very much for your support. Hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome, one and all. This is the Do Dissidents podcast. My name is Keaton Weiss, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming back for a second time Megan Day. She is a contributing writer at The Great Jacobin Magazine, uh, who has recently written a piece uh, called Why We Need Free College for Everyone even rich people. And uh, this is just one of many, many great pieces that, that Megan uh, has written. Uh, Megan, it's always kind of difficult. It was difficult for me to decide, hmm, when should I invite you back? Because there, I'm always tempted to invite you back every time I read one of your articles. Uh, but this one, I really felt the need to. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, why don't we just jump right in here? Um, one of the things I thought was great about this article is it, I always love when I read something and it sort of is able to clarify a sort of intuition that I had. Like, for instance, you talk about Pete Buttigieg talking about how we should means test tuition. And I'm I'm watching him and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm sure this is bullshit, but I, I just can't quite figure out how. And then I read your piece and it's like, aha, 
that's how. And so um, I thought it was really fantastic. So why don't you just give like the central thesis of it? And then it, the piece is, of course, uh, divided into four sections. So we'll take those one by one. But uh, go ahead. That sounds great. So the piece was uh, we had the idea for the piece precisely because Buddha Judge has come out doing this little um, act where he's saying that we shouldn't have tuition free college, but for reasons that have to do with economic inequality. So it's a little bait and switch. What he's saying is that we shouldn't build a universal social program funded by progressive taxes because somehow it would actually hurt poor people and be to the benefit of rich people. So we decided to write this piece at Jacobin and I was tasked with writing it and I was pleased to be able to task with writing it because it actually touches on one of my favorite themes. And one of the things that's most important to me is to drive home the necessity of universal social programs and how they're different from means tested programs. Cause this is the language that you often hear used to justify means tested programs. Oh, well we have to. So means testing, by the way, that means when you um, are, you're not building a universal program for everybody. You're deciding that certain benefits need to go specifically to people underneath a certain arbitrary cutoff point uh, below which they're considered low income or otherwise deserving of aid. And universal social programs are of course, the kind of thing that we all pay into based on our ability to pay. And then we all receive just because we're members of a society and we've decided that society would be better if we had that thing. So um, that's why I decided to write the piece. And with free college, it's actually, it's really, it's a, it's a little trickier. I mean, this is like easy for the means testers to make this argument because the reality is that right now, the people who go to college tend to come from wealthier families. Um, that's because college is really expensive, right? right? So obviously, if we eliminate college tuition, the demographics are going to change. But they just elide that point. They just don't mention that. And then they say, well, we don't want to do free college because that's a giveaway to the kind of people who go to college, which is rich people, right? So it's sort of tautological in a way. So that's why I decided to take on the piece um, and just talk about, you know, what exactly means testing is, why Democrats in particular are so obsessed with means testing, what the sort of like political principles that are animating that obsession are. Uh, and we can get into that a little bit more as we uh, go through this recording. But the main thesis is that we should have a free college program in the United States. It should be funded by progressive taxes. That means that rich people will be paying for it. It actually does fall on rich people to fund this thing. It's not a giveaway to rich people. This is a progressive tax funded program. And it's a necessary program because people should have a right to be able to prepare for their own future in any way they see fit without risking financial ruin. And, and college is one aspect of that. Trade school and job training of various kinds are another aspect of that. We're not trying to enshrine college as the only way for a person to be able to get ahead. Obviously, benefits and wages should be high enough across the board that if you don't go to college, you know, you're fine. Um, but if people want to go to college, they ought to be able to go to college. And we can afford that as a society by taxing the rich. And this really is about putting the onus on the wealthy in our society to actually shell out for a program that benefits the poor, not the other way around, as Pete Buttigieg claims. Right. Yeah. So I'll just quote your article. Uh, this is towards the beginning, because one of the things that it, I think it did so well is sort of expose this sort of smoke and mirrors game, because there are a number of ways where centrists or I should say there are a number of ways in which centrist politicians try to out left the left using this sort of duplicitous double talk, right? Um, they weaponize identity in certain ways to do that. And means testing, I think it goes right along with that. So I'll just quote from, from your article here. Despite appearances, Democrats' attraction to means testing is not rooted in a firm commitment to maximum equality. Plainly put, they like means testing because targeted social programs cost less money than universal social programs. Means testing, this is was so key, means testing allows them to limit taxes on their ruling class donor base while still superficially appeasing their working class voter base. And so, you know, it's nothing new that these guys sort of have to toe the line between, you know, uh, sort of, you know, placating their voters and satisfying their donors. And, you know, it, it really brings into such clear focus how this sort of means testing scam uh, is a way of pulling that off. And they sort of use class politics against the people who really care about class politics by doing that. Is that right? That's absolutely true. I mean, means testing is like 
the perfect invention for a party that is a contradiction in class terms, like the Democratic Party. Right. So importantly, you know, the United States has never had a labor party. We've never had a party that explicitly or not a strong party that explicitly exists for the purpose of advancing working class interests against ruling class interests. Unfortunately, the closest that we have is the Democratic Party. Republicans, obviously, you know, like I say in the piece, they're they're less inclined to nuance and they just sort of uh, assail social programs wherever wherever possible. Democrats are trying to toe a line. So they're trying to come off as the party of the more liberal party, the party that is more likely to advocate for the working class, but they also are, you know, uh, deeply um, indebted to the ruling class. In the United States, what we have is basically two parties of capital that also split a working class voter base. So, you know, there are, there are ruling class um, Republicans and ruling class Democrats. There are working class Republicans and working class Democrats. This is not like to be taken for granted. There are plenty of scenarios throughout history where parties have existed explicitly to advance the interests of the working class. We don't have that. So what we do have is the Democratic Party that has to kind of do a uh, walk a tightrope where they're showing their working class constituents who lean more liberal and are perhaps a little more class conscious than Republican working class constituents that they care about class issues, but they can't go all the way because, uh, you know, they know who butters their bread. Like that's that's the ruling class, you know, that's rich people in real estate, rich people in tech, rich people in Hollywood, you know, rich people across the board who tend to be more liberal. Those are the people who they need to appease. So means testing is perfect because it allows them to basically carve out a section of the population who would be eligible for certain programs. It's smaller than the whole population, which means that it's going to be cheaper. It means that they don't have to levy extremely heavy taxes against the rich, but they can pretend that they're sort of of, you know, taking care of the poor. You see this with, um, and some of these programs are great, by the way. I think they're good. I think they should be expanded into universal social programs, though. So you see this with everything from, like, you know, FAFSA. That's actually, that's the example we should be talking about here. There is a means-tested federal financial aid program for helping low-income people afford college. Yeah, and it's a complete nightmare to navigate. It's a, night it's a complete nightmare. <laughs> so let's get to that in a little bit, because I want to take these in order, if that's okay with you, because um, yeah. you, you split the article into four different sections. The first is called Who Really Pays? And this is sort of the simplest one, so that's why I think it was – uh, smart of you to structure the piece the way you did. And also I think a good reason why we should discuss this first. So who really pays? Let's talk about that. Go ahead. So what Pete Buttigieg wants you to think is that, and actually Hillary Clinton too, I opened the piece and I'll say this now, I opened the piece with a, a quote from Hillary Clinton in 2016. Bernie Sanders had of course put uh, tuition free public colleges and universities into his platform and she took aim at him and said, she, this is a quote from her, she said, now I'm a little different from those who say free college for everybody. I am not in favor of making college free for Donald Trump's kids. This was a way to sort of harness class rage um, at the rich and actually weaponize it against a universal social program that would disproportionately benefit you know, poor, low-income people. Um, and what she's missing there is that the Trump family and rich families would be paying for a universal public tuition-free college program. They would just not be paying in the form of tuition. They would be paying in the form of taxes. And in fact, they would not just be paying over a four-year period or however long, they would be paying over the course of their entire lifetimes to fund this system that exists sort of in perpetuity. It's like a permanent system that they're constantly paying for. So this is a completely hollow and disingenuous argument, the idea that we're somehow letting rich people off the hook and they're not going to be paying for college. And then there's the other the other fact that, you know, we're, the proposals that are being put forward for tuition-free public colleges and universities don't eliminate private universities. At the moment, rich people send their kids to private universities. They don't send them typically to public universities, except for the very elite public universities that are actually really expensive, almost almost on par with private universities. I'm thinking where I live, the University of uh, California, Berkeley. Um, so 
So they're going to pay. And in fact, they'll, they'll either do one of two things. They're either going to pay, you know, uh, their whole lives. They're going to be paying higher taxes than uh, low income and middle class people um, to fund this program. And they're going to send their kids to these public universities or they're going to be paying their whole lives to fund this program. And they're just going to send their kids to private universities and pay private tuition on top of that. Either way, that's more money coming out of their pockets. So it's completely disingenuous to claim that they're, you know, not we're going to let them off the hook by creating this program. Sure um, thing. Yeah. The other point that I wanted to make is some, perhaps a minor point, but I think it's, it's a good one, is that if, you know, they're probably, the Baron Trump, just like all of the other Trump children so far, is probably going to go to an elite private university with private tuition. But let's say we live in a future in which, for some reason, um, you know, do, the children of the wealthy are actually going to these uh, public uh, colleges and universities for free, quote unquote free, as in they're not paying tuition for it, you know, suddenly the rich people in this country are going to care about the quality of a public education, which they don't care about at all right now. And so you'd actually probably see an improvement in quality in public education. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's also very telling that all of a sudden there's such thing as a free lunch, right? Like centrist Democrats always sort of adopt the conservative line, which is that nothing's really free. Right. Except when they have to make this point that, oh, you're going to give Baron Trump a free education. That doesn't make sense. Right. So in other words, there's just like this this sudden pivot back away from this sort of conservative line that nothing is really free. Of course, if rich people are paying higher taxes, then they're not really getting it for free. It's free in the same way that universal health care would be free, be free at the point of service. But of course, it's paid for. Um, now, the other thing that I was going to uh, ask you about this is that you, the fact that the status quo is such that wealthier people or people who are more economically secure tend to go to college in the first place. Does that make it easier for the Buttigieg's and the Clintons to sort of make a point like that? Because they, they couldn't really make that point if they were referring to some other universal decommodified service. So, for example, they would never say like, oh, so you want the fire department to put out Jeff Bezos' uh, mansion when he lights it on fire? <laughs> like you, you couldn't say that, right? Because, of course – Rich people shouldn't get a bill from the fire department when they have an emergency and the fire department comes and puts it out. It's a universal program. Absolutely. This is, they're having a field day with this because it is a lot easier for them to make this case. And it's a case they're always itching to make whenever universal, I mean, whenever universal programs are proposed instead of means tested programs, this is what they'd like to be able to say. But it's not always possible to be able to say that because college is like more optional than something like healthcare. Like you just need healthcare in order to not die. But you don't. Right quote unquote need college. Now, arguably you do in order to be able to have, you know, decent employment prospects. It's becoming more and more necessary to have a degree um, or to have jobs. Right. And once again, who are the people fighting to change that? Us, not them. We're the ones fighting for $15 minimum wage, right? We're the ones, you know, trying to make it easier for people without college degrees to have a decent standard of living. Yeah. And we're trying to do both at the same time. We're trying to say, look, uh, the, the, the work of, en uh, of ending economic inequality does not stop at making college tuition free, but we're not going to be able to uh, eliminate economic inequality or even get anywhere close to eliminating economic inequality unless we address the fact that there's this major barrier and who has decent employment prospects in our economy and who doesn't. It's somewhat arbitrary. It's based on a college degree. The college degree doesn't reflect, you know, the type of training that you actually received. So, um, you know, there are people who have like a fair amount of job training, but don't have a college degree, but it's like in a, um, a lax labor market, you know, uh, employers are just looking for arbitrary ways to turn away candidates. So like a college degree is the easiest one that they choose. So we just need to remove that barrier. And that's obviously going to be to the benefit of, um, you know, people who are really struggling in this economy. And so that's that's the point that, that we make. But they have a really easy go to. And you saw Pete Buttigieg using this, which is, uh, uh, excuse me, I think that, you know, middle class people are more likely to go to college than uh, working class or low income people. And so if you're making college free, isn't that a giveaway to the kinds, quote unquote, kinds of people who go to college, which it just sort of it doesn't accept that this is a, not a static situation. 
you know, who does and doesn't go to college is not written in stone. That's actually something that's, you know, it's a, it's, it's derivative of politics. And if we have different types of politics and different types of policies, we can actually considerably change the demographics of student bodies. You'd see many, many working class people who have an appetite to go to college just simply don't. Be, the number one reason that working class people say uh, that they're not going to college is because they can't afford it. Um, and of course, their staff's up, but it's confusing. And we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, you know, it rings really hollow, but it's a, it's a, it's an easy, cheap trick for them to get out of uh, advocating for universal social programs, which again, to, to remind listeners, the reason they want to get out of universal social programs is because you have to tax rich, the rich to pay for those. And the democratic party is such a contradiction and it is so beholden to the capitalist class while also being beholden to its working class constituency that it just doesn't want to do that. Absolutely. Yep. So let's get into the FAFSA stuff because the second section of your piece is called Miles of Red Tape and uh, FAFSA fits into that uh, perfectly. Yeah. So Miles of Red Tape, this section is basically starts off with asking the question, you know, but why can't we just design a public financial aid system that identifies exactly how much tuition help a person needs and gives it to them instead of making the whole thing publicly funded? And this is the ideal that's sort of held aloft by proponents of means testing, but the problem with it is is twofold, and I wanted to make both of these points in this section. First, it's a complete nightmare to execute, because the idea that somebody is deserving or undeserving of aid is completely arbitrary. You just have to draw a line somewhere, and you're essentially drawing a line right through the lower middle class. That's typically where that line gets drawn. Um, and it's it's a disaster and it's, you know, it's bureaucratic and it's confusing and it's demoralizing. And so a lot of working class people simply don't want to go through the process of trying to access this aid. And in fact, I think let me try to find this figure. Um, how much money uh, was left over? That's right. In 2017, two point three billion dollars in federal student aid money that was set aside actually went unclaimed because this um, process is so confusing, it's so demoralizing, it's very intimidating. It's actually built into the design of it. This is one of the reasons why Democrats like means testing is because they can point to the programs and say, look, we, we built that program. But the program isn't reaching the people that it's intended to reach. People are intimidated, confused, and demoralized by it, so they don't apply for it. So the money doesn't actually get dispersed. Well, that's good because it costs less money, which allows them to sort of balance budgets and ease taxes on rich people and, you know, take care of that sort of portion of their Right. Well, that, that was such a great point. I don't want you to just skate past that too quickly because you said that this is actually – and I'm quoting again – this is actually part of means testing's appeal for centrist politicians. So the fact that it is so complicated, so – as to keep people away and leave this surplus left over, that's by design is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Basically how it breaks down is that the more difficult it is for people to prove themselves deserving of aid, the fewer people are going to attempt and succeed. And like I say in the piece, that means fewer program enrollees. And that saves money. And that allows politicians who have this double agenda to get away with slashing taxes for the rich. Like I said, they can balance their budgets. And they can also, because the program exists, even though it's not working, they can continue to promise the working class that they have its best interests at heart and be able to sort of like skate by in elections that way. So it's a win-win for, you know, centrist politicians um, and the wealthy. But the working class is, you know, it loses, loses out. Even though the programs exist, the working class is still losing out. And the other point that I want to make about about this is that these programs are very politically vulnerable. Um, and well, that, I, I, that's the next section. Let me just make the because uh, uh, sorry because <laughs> I think what you mean by the next the next section is called the undeserving poor, and I think you make that point so well in that next point. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so I just want to just uh, plant a, a, a small flag right here because this miles of red tape. We see this now in Obamacare. Right. I mean, we see the difference between a, a, a national health service type system or a Medicare for all type system and Obamacare. Obamacare is this unbelievably complicated sort of like Rube Goldberg machine of a health care system. And, you know, my wife and I and now my, my two kids are both are all on Obamacare. And every year we go to renew it. We're nervous that we're going to lose it because what if some rule changed or what if we made slightly too much money this year to get this subsidy or that subsidy or, you know, what's going to happen? Right. And, and so it 
you know, it, it doesn't keep us away because obviously healthcare, unlike college, is, is a must. We need to have it. So we go through the process of making this happen. But it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly uh distressing to to think that, oh no, what if some arbitrary uh rule uh changed? Or what if we end up on the wrong side by a little bit of this arbitrary rule and we don't get uh, healthcare this year, or because we have maybe bumped up into a higher income bracket, our healthcare is now going to be four times as expensive as it was last year. And so, you know, for people who are are you know looking for an, an example of where these sort of neoliberal means tested sort of you know half assed uh, social programs can actually create more red tape than universal programs, Obamacare is a perfect example of that. And it's always. This, you know, the 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 conservative attack on universal programs is always that there's going to be too much bureaucracy involved, too much inefficiency involved. You know, it's going to be too complicated. And what we see here is the opposite, right? The the universal programs are are the easy ones to figure out, the easy ones to navigate, the easy ones to actually access. Uh, whereas these other kind of hybrids uh, are much much more difficult. Absolutely. I mean, people don't talk about the way that you just spoke about Obamacare. People don't talk about that with Medicare. You know, Medicare has its has its flaws. Um, and most of those flaws are caused by, you know, um, attacks on it by austerity politicians to actually make it more like Obamacare. Right. right. Um, the problem with something like Obamacare is that as complicated as it is and as many arbitrary thresholds as it applies, uh, it actually becomes really unpopular. People who are eligible for aid uh, don't like the programs because they're an absolute headache and they make them feel sort of precarious and insecure. Uh, people who are not eligible are really resentful of people who are eligible. And that is a really big problem. This is part of why I say that it makes them politically vulnerable. Is because, yeah, sure. So let's get into that section. Yeah. Yep. So the, any, any program that's designed for the quote unquote deserving poor can be very straightforwardly undermined by simply evoking the specter of the undeserving poor, which gets us into culture war territory. So, you know, you have programs that are designed to, you know, basically as a form of like charity from uh, members of society who are um, assumed to be able to take care of themselves toward uh, members of society who are presumed to be unable to take care of themselves. Well, but you have, you're drawing a really arbitrary line right through, like I said, usually the lower middle class. And that means that there are people right above that line who actually don't personally feel like they're able to take care of themselves without some kind of assistance. And they become really resentful of the people who are, you know, able to access that aid. And actually it just erodes solidarity. And what it's, it's the worst part about it really is that it's very easy to exploit um, by politicians politicians, you know, de demagogic politicians who want to add a sort of like cultural overtone to this. So you see this with like the racist undertones or overtones to uh, welfare queens and things like that. It's the idea that you can convince people that actually, you know, the people who are actually receiving the programs kind of hate them because they're, you know, absolutely confused on Section 8 housing. For example, people who receive Section 8 housing vouchers are not like I really love my Section 8. They're not talking about it the way that British people talk about the NHS. British people are obsessed with the NHS. Section 8 housing voucher recipients are not obsessed with Section 8 housing vouchers, you know? <laughs> right. It's like a thing that you have to navigate to be able to access the basic means of survival, and, like, it's totally a headache. And then people who are not eligible for it, it's very easy to convince them that anybody who receives a Section 8 housing voucher is just sponging off the system. I mean, look at me. I work hard. I struggle. I could really use something like, something like that or you know, like Medicaid, for example, something like help help with my ability to afford health care. And I don't get it. Um, I'm an honest, uh, um, forthright person. I'm not, you know, a welfare queen or a loafer or a sponger. And then you add to that all of the sort of like racial overtones or other kind of cultural overtones. And uh, it just gets really messy. And you know what it does is it actually just makes these programs really easy to attack and dismantle because nobody likes them. Nobody loves them. Some people like them or they need them or they know they need them, but nobody loves them. And this is something that we've lost track of in the United States with the exception of Medicare and Social Security. It's very hard to, for us to conceive of something that's true in countries around the world, which is that people love some social programs, like actually like have an emotional attachment to them because they know that it's a social contract. It's something that they're paying into. It's something that they're benefiting from. It's, you know, a promise that they're, they are participating in, a promise that society makes to them, and a promise that they make to society to participate in, and everyone benefits. 
So, you know, unfortunately, we don't really have a ton of those programs in the United States, and it's hard for us to conceive of them existing. The ones we do have, it's just so easy for Republicans to say, we've got to cut aid for this, and, you know, we're going to add work requirements to Medicaid because those Medicaid recipients are so lazy and by the way, Medicaid recipients, the vast majority of them have jobs. But these work requirements, again, what they do is they don't push people. They say they want to push people to get jobs. Okay, people, these people already have jobs. What they're actually doing is making more red tape. And people get dropped from the rolls because they didn't fill out the paperwork. So that means that the programs have fewer enrollees, which means they cost less money, which means there's more room in the budget for corporate giveaways to the rich, which is what these corporate politicians are really after in the first place. Yeah, yeah, a a absolutely. And and I, I just want to read a sentence that that you said quickly, but it's it's so perfect and it, it bears reading one more time. Any program designed for the quote unquote deserving poor can be straightforwardly undermined by evoking the specter of the undeserving poor. That's probably my favorite sentence in the whole piece. And what we spoke last time, I don't know if you recall, but I, I mentioned how when I was a kid and I would go to school, there were certain kids because I went to school in a pretty poor city. I grew up in a sort of middle class white suburb outside a very poor, diverse city, and it was a magnet school district. And so we all got bussed in uh, to the city, sort of like the opposite of what what, what the, the Harris v. Biden debate was. They would actually bus uh, middle class and upper class white kids into a poor city and we would all go to school. Um, but I, I, I mentioned that, you know, a lot of the poor kids um, qualified for free school lunches and that even before, like I was, you know, this is when I was in like first, second, third grade. I could tell that there was this resentment among the people who had to pay for their school lunches towards the people who didn't. And I paid a dollar per meal for that school lunch. And so it cost my parents 180 bucks a year, assuming I bought a lunch every single day. There were certain days where I brought my own lunch, stuff like that. It's $180 a year. And now my parents obviously didn't resent it that much. If they had, I would not have grown up to be a man interviewing you right now. <laughs> but, um, you know, that resentment totally exists. And, and, and it, is, it is such a powerful, potent weapon that right wing elements can use to attack these programs. Whereas like if they just gave everybody a free lunch, right, th there wouldn't be such a problem. Absolutely. I mean, you're making a really good point, which is that the friction that it creates, that these means tested programs creates is between people whose life circumstances actually look somewhat similar to each other. So if right, you because are, by drawing that line through the working class, like you just said, you're basically creating a class war where the upper class gets to just sit above it all and watch. Sure. And you have, you know, professional managerial class liberals in large cities with like, you know, um, high, high five figure, six figure salaries are just sort of like, yeah, I love Medi Medicaid. I, like, I'm happy to pay for, for Medicaid because I care about people and this doesn't, you know, this is not a problem for me and I, I'm like a good person and I want, you know, poor people to be able to have health care. But then you've got people who are, you know, just more in a, in a, in a difficult financial situation. People who, whose circumstances are closer to the people who are actually receiving Medicaid are the ones who are becoming extraordinarily resentful of the fact that some people are receiving help and they're not. And it's just like, this is the opposite of what needs to be happening in our culture. We need broad solidarity across the working class in order to be able to advocate for working class interests against ruling class interests. And means-tested programs actually do the opposite. They put fractures where they don't need to exist, artificial fractures within the working class. And like I said before, those are very easily exploited for, um, you know, cultural purposes, specifically racist purposes. And that just erodes the foundation of solidarity in our culture and makes every fight harder. You know, it's, it's very, when we, when you have a culture that's so, the fabric of which is so destroyed, it's riven by this conflict between people who ought to be on each other's side, it just makes every single fight that much harder. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that that's a perfect uh, sort of uh, segue to the final uh, section of your piece, which is partners in prosperity. And uh, I mentioned earlier how, you know, uh, you would never means test something like the police department or the fire department. Right. And um, I, I think this sort of section gets to why we would never do that and why we ought to bring things like healthcare and in this 
in the context of this conversation, higher education in, into that realm. So why don't you talk a little bit about that final section of the piece? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's this concept that started to emerge. Um, I can't remember the author, but people should go look it up. It's a book published by the U Chicago Press called The Submerged State. The idea that we don't what we what we have, we have a, a social safety net in the United States. It's just largely invisible and very confusing. And so people don't have like an emotional attachment to it. And people in many cases don't realize the extent to which they benefit from it. And so it's very easy to politically convince people that welfare states are bad and anybody who benefits from welfare states is like a moocher uh, sponging off the system and so on. Um, this is not, you know, the case everywhere in every circumstance in every historical scenario. It is possible instead to build universal social programs that are widely beloved. And an example of this is K through 12 public schools. This obviously bears directly on the example of tuition-free college because tuition-free college would be an extension of the K through 12 program. If we take it for granted that we have a public K through 12 system. And obviously most people are extraordinarily supportive of that. Uh, obviously there, you know, there are also tax, you know, in the form of like very insidious, like charter, charterization and privatization of, of the public system and so on. But for the most part, people just think it's like normal, natural, and very good that we have public education for adolescents and children in this country. Well, we shouldn't take that for granted. That wasn't always the case. It's something that was won by working class people demanding their right to be able to have an education and in many ways to be able to have a childhood, right? Right. It's not to right. work when they're children and instead to be able to learn and prepare for the future. Um, and so my sort of contention is that we can actually do that exact same thing with college and, and all, all across our society. We can do it with health care. You know, we could do that with housing, actually. I know it seems like a stretch to people considering the intense commodification of housing, but there are still today, if you go to Vienna, you know, the vast majority of people actually live in public housing across all up and down the income spectrum and they love it. And they, and it's like an, it's like a cultural institution that they're proud of. They're proud that they have public housing. It's like a legacy of their city that actually goes back to a period of socialist governance um, uh, between world wars, where they just decided that everyone should be able to have high quality housing. And so you know what they were gonna do? They were gonna tax the rich and they were gonna build it. And if you wanted to live in it, you could. And a lot of people wanted to live in it because it was fantastic housing. So, you know, we have some of these things we have you know, Social Security and Medicare, we did all decide in the 1960s that, or 1930s and then in the 60s again, that being an older person, no matter what happened for the earlier decades of your life, no matter how quote unquote successful you are, you deserve to live out your final decades with some semblance of dignity and security. And what the argument for free college is essentially that there are also there's an, there is another very important period of your life in addition to being you know an, a child and an adolescent where we carve out your ability to have um, you know uh, an education and then we, we we carve out the final decades of your life to be able to have social security and Medicare afforded to you through progressive taxes. There's also another important period of your life which is the period in which you're beginning to enter the workforce. You're thinking about entering the workforce and you should be able to prepare for that in whatever way you see fit. fit. And that it is possible to just decide as a society in the same way that we decided to have a universal postal system, right? We all decided that we should be able to send and receive mail. And we just decided to pay taxes and based on income to make it possible. And of course, some people don't use that system, but we still have it and we want to still have it. We could do that for college. We could just say like, look, college is a thing that's available to all. Public universities should be tuition free. They are public institutions. We should use tax the rich and use the money to keep them open and keep them, you know, available to anybody who wants to go to them because presumably they belong to the public. Right. So right. that's sort of contention there. And then I have make some other points, which I don't know if you want to get into about, you know, engines of solidarity, which is a phrase I did not coin, but which I love very mm -hmm. dearly. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So the point that I try to make here, and I'll, I'll just quote a sentence from the piece is that, as I've explained, means-tested programs are they're chaotic and they're politically delicate engines of division. So by contrast, universal social, social programs are elegant and they're politically sturdy engines of solidarity. This is a phrase that uh, entered my lexicon. It came from a, a writer named Robbie Nelson who wrote a piece for Jacobin called Engines of Solidarity. And the point that he makes there, um, and that I've really uh, grown to adopt myself, is that 
you know, at their best, universal social programs actually engender in people, they do the opposite of means testing. They engender in people a sense of collective investment and common cause. So everybody chips in what they can, and everybody enjoys the fruits of their contributions. And we just decide to do that because society is better if we have things like education, like job training and preparation, like, you know, Social Security and Medicare, like a postal service, like fire department and so on. So what the, what's different about them from means testing, in addition to them being extremely sturdy, you know, it's, it's difficult to attack them, is that they also they feel not like charity, but like a mutual endeavor. Right. It's something that you participate in because you're a person and you and you you're a member of society and you get to, you know, enjoy um, the benefits of that uh, because you paid into it. Right. It's, so it's a collective, collective endeavor. Sure so. Thing. So the other point that I make is that, you know, I think that like means testing actually breeds alienation and competition, which is something that I just explained. So um, by contrast, robust universal social programs, like a very, you know, thick and sturdy welfare state model, it breeds trust and cooperation between people. And that I think is an important foundation for other fights that you might want to have to actually push society forward and uh, make it progress in a way as to, you know, eliminate, you know, economic inequality and uh, other, you know, social ills. Um, sure. Yeah. And that, that the, 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 what makes the means tested programs politically vulnerable is not just the resentment that they create, but the fact that they are complicated and difficult uh, to, to access and difficult to figure out uh, makes it very easy for conservative elements to sort of poison the well when we start to talk about expanding these means-tested programs into more universal programs. Like uh, I, I just – because Joe Biden just released his uh, health care plan, uh, people are calling that Obamacare on steroids. And it reminded me that we used to hear from you know Fox News and, and, and all these different right-wing media outlets and right-wing politicians that you know this is a goal back a couple of years, but Medicare for all is Obamacare on steroids. Yeah. And Medicare for all is not Obama. Medicare for all is Obamacare on steroids the way a, a pineapple is a grape on steroids. Like they're, they're two completely different things. But because Obamacare is so complicated, people just figure, oh, it's government health care. So Medicare for all is going to be more government health care. Therefore, it's a bigger uh, you know, you know better, more chaotic, more confusing, more nightmarish version of Obamacare. When it's in fact quite the, exactly the opposite. This is the point that I right. want to make, is that means tested programs are not and universal social programs are not like it's not like a universal social program is a big reversion of means tested social program. It's a totally different animal. And like think about, you know, think about um, like the postal service. That's a totally different type of thing than Medicaid. Like it's right. just something that everybody pays into and that everybody enjoys the benefits from. Right? Um, right. And so I also wanted to make the point that, you know, the national health care, the national health service in the UK really is a good example of one of the things about this engines of solidarity concept is that it's actually creating constituencies that will defend the thing, constituencies that didn't exist before. But when you start to enshrine things as social rights and build programs to disperse them and to collect the money to disperse them, now suddenly people just see, become very, you know, defensive of it, right? Like that's mine. Like that's don't don't come for my NHS, basically. So obviously the NHS in the UK faces assault from neoliberal privatizers. As long as we have capitalism and the capitalist class and capitalist politicians, this kind of thing is always going to happen. Um, so it's not completely invulnerable to attack. But a recent poll found that seven in 10 people in the UK back the basic principle behind the NHS, which is sure. that health care should be funded from general taxation for everyone and, the, and you, everyone should be able to have health care. And only 4% of people in the UK said that they wanted to have an American style system. And I would love to talk to those 4% because they're out, <laughs> out of their mind. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I read that. Right. I read those numbers as well. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, the instinct, if you were to repeal the NHS, right, the first person who gets a bill for, you know, 15 grand for, you know, some foot operation that they had. Is their instinct going to be, well, I take pride in paying this because I'm not some moocher who doesn't have to, or is their first instinct going to be, what the fuck is this? I thought this was 
paid for with my tax dollars. Right. Like, it, it, I think that's, you know, it, it, it really is a, a way uh, to sort of drive home that, yes, we do need these universal programs, because if you take one away, people's first instinct is not going to be that they're happy to pay. Now, right. As a complete aside, this is not mentioned anywhere in the piece, but it, it strikes me that part of the reason why conservatism is so durable in the United States as an ideology is that people who are really attached to their own financial struggles in a way, like people make meaning out of their ability to overcome their own financial struggles. And that's yes. just like the particularity of our, of our, of, of a culture characterized by austerity and by widespread financial hardship is like, you know, you know, personally, and I know personally, many people, people I grew up around who have a, take a real sense of pride in, you know, being able to pay their bills, getting big bills and being able to work hard and pay them. And that is like how they feel like they are, you know, a strong person, uh, a forthright person, a member, uh, a productive member of society. And, but in other places, in other contexts, people take pride in something totally different. Like in, in the United, in the United Kingdom, which of course has many, you know, faults of its own. It's not like a utopia by any means, but let's talk about the NHS example in particular. People take pride in paying into a system and, and having and building all together this incredible system that, you know, works a lot better than the, the United States system, despite what various, you know, corporate funded think tanks put out studies that'll try to convince you otherwise. I mean, it's obviously true. I was, I lived in the UK for a year. I had had some, you know, uh, occasions to visit medical establishments. And I can tell you firsthand that that is a, a far superior system than the one we have here. Um, and then I also wanted to say that in the piece, I had to throw this in because it really demonstrates the degree of cultural attachment and pride that people have to these universal social programs in 2012. Uh, the Olympic Games were held in London, and the opening ceremony to the Olympic Games featured a tribute to the NHS designed yep. by a choreographer with dancers who were dressed like patients and nurses encircling a giant blazing acronym that said NHS. And this was like the face that, you know, London wanted to present to the world. Like, the, I mean, the, the amount of pride that people have in this program is really stunning. And it's like kind of difficult for Americans to imagine because we actually have very few of those programs. And the ones that we do are like more submerged than the NHS is. And actually, Nigel Lawson, um, who was like a privatizer in the UK uh, under Margaret Thatcher and himself was responsible for, you know, shredding the welfare state to bits had certainly attempted to do the same thing to the NHS. And in his frustration, he's known to have said that the NHS is the closest thing the English have to a religion. This was obviously a source of frustration for him, but for us, we can imagine mm -hmm. how wonderful it would be to have universal social programs that were that invulnerable to attack, considering how vulnerable our means tested programs are in the United States. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic point. And, and you're so right that people take a, a sort of pride in their ability to overcome these financial hurdles that shouldn't be there in the first place. I mean, it's almost a stereotype, right? It's almost a caricature of like, you know, some some rundown sort of piece of shit trailer compound in the middle of the woods where the guy's sitting out there with no teeth and, you know, in, in a, in a dirty wife beater. He's got nothing except this little trailer, but he's got his American flag on that trailer because that trailer is his and he worked for it and he paid for it. And even though if, you know, his quality of life may be uh, pretty lousy compared to someone in a country with, uh, like you said, more of these universal programs, but it is almost, it's, it's woven into the sort of fabric of American mythology that we ought to not take anything for granted. And if I got this little piece of crap house and I got four teeth left, I should be proud of my house and the teeth that I was, that I, you know, could sort of afford to, to, to keep in my mouth. You know what I mean? And, 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 and look, I, I don't want to speak in a mocking way about them because I, I think in all seriousness, like we do want to make life better for that guy. Right. And, and, and we, we want to convince that guy, uh, that, that, that he should, uh, you know, sort of pay more mind to people like us when we talk like this. Right. So I, I don't want to do the like Hillary deplorable game here, but, but it is true that like people have to get past that, uh, sort of part of their, 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 their psyche. Right. And, and, and sort of figure out a way to somehow break free of that. And, I got to mention Bernie to you because I know you cover Bernie. He speaks in a way that gets people to do that. I mean, he did very well among rural voters last time. Hopefully he can duplicate that success this time. But I think that sort of plain spokenness about him 
uh, may give us a sort of breakthrough uh, where, where we need it. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that Bernie does a fantastic job with this. And actually, like I wrote this article about free college. I think that's a fantastic demand, an important one to advance. But to my mind, the demand that is most that is best poised to make a major intervention in American culture and to actually sort of flip the script and give people a sense that there's another source of pride besides their ability to like manage their obstacles, their unnecessary obstacles, instead a type of like sort of civic pride and being able to collaborate with their neighbors who I, I, I've called this uh, section partners in prosperity because it's the idea that you would see your neighbor not as an competitor to you, but as a partner um, in building a better society. I think the demand best poised to make that intervention is actually Medicare for all. And I think yeah. that it's great that he's pairing it with um, free college um, and also the Green New Deal, which I don't mention anywhere in the article, but which has some similar you know, attributes to it. I think it's good to pair them all together because then you know, you're sort of raising consciousness and like putting forward a, a thorough agenda that actually just changes the nature of how we think about politics in the United States. But Medicare for all is it speaks to the thing that people have perhaps the uh, it's mo the most generalized amount of like anguish and despair and misery and also just basic like frustration and irritation and um, annoyance with like a shitty system. Uh, Medicare for all can speak to all of those emotions and actually say, look, if we all come together and if we see each other as partners in prosperity, we can actually build a system that works for everybody. That's much simpler. That's much more elegant. You get a card in the mail and it says health care on it. And with this card, you can go to the hospital or doctor or clinic of your choosing. You never have to worry about them being in network. You're not going to be charged co-pays. You're not going to be charged premiums. You won't have deductibles. You're going to pay for those things in taxes. And the people who are richer than you are going to be paying for it with even more taxes because they can. And we pay according, you know, from each, according to his ability to each, according to his need. And that's how we create something that makes you know, society better. And you see how different that is from the way that most Americans, many Americans in any case, walk through the world feeling like their sense of identity and their ability to make meaning in the world actually derives from their ability to meet these obstacles that are totally unnecessary. You know, the private insurance industry is itself completely unnecessary. It does not need to exist. It does not exist in various other countries. And I, hopefully it will no longer exist in our country after the passage of Medicare for all. But it creates obstacles for people now. And people feel, I think, when they are able to pay their bills, when they're able to when they work, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week and they're able to pay their medical bills, that that is like a sense of pride. We want to basically build a kind of society where pride is derived from another type of process, a more collaborative process rather than an individualistic process. Right. And not just individualistic, but individual suffering. And I think the immigration issue, uh, you, you sort of uh, this this sort of sort of um, uh mythology uh, around sort of human suffering seeps into that as well. Because what do we hear? I mean, I hear it all the time. My ancestors were Irish. My ancestors were Sicilian. Life was hell for them when they came here. So why shouldn't life be hell for these people when they're coming here now? Right. It's that same ethic, right? That, that same philosophy that, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to suffer because, you know, that is part of what makes you virtuous, right? That, that it, it, you know, that, 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 that is a necessary, uh, part of your experience and, and a thing to, to, to be almost proud of. And we're very attached to our suffering in the United States. And you know what, you know, who that works best for is the capitalist class. Yeah, sure. I mean, of course. <laughs> they get off scot free with our sort of like obsession with, uh, you know, generalizing suffering and putting everyone into a gauntlet where they have to compete with each other over scraps. I mean, that works perfectly for the people who, you know, are seeking to privatize everything and constantly expand into new markets, constantly commodify things that, you know, we could very easily pay for altogether and taxes, um, yeah, it works. It works perfectly for them that, you know, that we're we have a masochistic relationship to our own exploitation at their hands. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because they, you know, once you're a couple of generations in, you know, in a billionaire family, you don't have any of those stories of your own. Like mm -hmm. Donald Trump doesn't have a story like that. Right. He can't say, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, when were the stakes ever really high? You know what I yeah. love? 
just as an aside that actually one of Bernie, one of the, my favorite moments of the Bernie campaign so far this time around was I actually attended his um, kickoff rally in Brooklyn, which is where he was raised, where he was yep. raised in a, I think, three or four room rent controlled apartment with a father who came to this country who spoke no, not a word of English and worked, I think, as a house painter or something like that. Um, and really, they genuinely, he calls it a lower middle class existence. I think that there's a certain humility there. He's trying to project onto people an understanding that he knows that there's worse suffering than his, but that's a working class existence. And um, one of my favorite moments was when at this Brooklyn speech Right there, you know, not far from where he was raised, he drew a sharp contrast between himself and Donald Trump. And he said when Donald Trump was given some sort of ungodly amount of money as, a, as an allowance as a child. And I was given, you know, 25 cents a week. Yeah. Um, and then he said, Donald, you know, Donald Trump's uh, made his fortune on you know, uh, housing on, on, a, on a real estate empire that was actually built on housing discrimination, racial discrimination against people in housing. And I, when I was that same age, or perhaps a little bit younger, he was, he was in college, was um, fighting housing discrimination in Chicago with, you know, core the Congress of Racial Equality. And then he said, you know, Donald Trump became famous by going on television and telling, or telling people, you're fired. I come from a home and a community that knows the incredible power that employers have over their employees' lives and doesn't take it for granted. I mean, I got goosebumps when he said that, but that's the kind of like class polarization that he's bringing to this primary uh, primary process and bringing into the national political culture in general. And that's the kind of class awareness, I think, that we need to instill in people in order to successfully push for things like, you know, free, pub, uh, free tuition, free public university and college, like Medicare for all, and even like a Green New Deal with a with a job guarantee built into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just have one more question for you that because we brought it back to tuition. One of the differences between Bernie's student debt cancellation plan and Elizabeth Warren's student debt cancellation plan is essentially what we're talking about. Right. Bernie's is universal and Warren's is means tested. Mm -hmm. Warren's would cover the majority of people who have student debt. So there's, you know, you can't knock it too hard because honestly, if it passed, it would transform people's lives. But the real difference is that Bernie just went all the way with it because I think he understands exactly what I'm talking about here, that there is something fundamentally different about the logic of a universal social program versus a means tested program. Exactly. So if you actually have a larger vision for political transformation in this country, uh, you could do no better than to actually just go all the way, go all the way to a universal social program. Don't stop just short of it like Elizabeth Warren. In some way, I wonder like why, given that she's perfectly familiar with the concept of universal social programs, would she actually go out of her way to build a more complicated program just to make it means tested? Is it because she wants to be able to head off attacks from people like Buddha Judge or like you know, the, the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party when they use these, you know, means testing trickery arguments. If, if so, then I would say that, that doesn't show, you know, the type of courage that we need in this moment. Sorry to knock Elizabeth Warren, who I, I like quite a bit. She's certainly my number two choice. But like with Bernie Sanders, the fact that he's just willing to go all the way and say, you know what? Nope. We have public tuition free college in this country. We have universal debt cancellation in this country. It is I have a theory about why she doesn't want to to go that far. And I think the reason she doesn't want to go that far is because she doesn't want to be attacked the way Bernie is attacked as as sort of having these simple programs that are not well thought out. See, one of the things that's so effective about Bernie is the simplicity of his message. But the Warren voters and 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 sort of Warren herself brands herself as this brainiac, right? This wonk. So if I create nuance, even where there need not be nuance, then they can't attack me as some simpleton who's making promises that I can't fulfill, right? I'm going to I'm going to present this image that I think through every detail of every plan, and so I think she sort of creates these asterisks within these plans for precisely that reason. I think that's true. And it's, it, it's, it, that is something that, you know, we have two sides of the point here. We have working people who are making meaning out of their struggles in a way that they need not. Right. 
And then we have, you know, like liberals who are sort of making meaning out of the complication of systems that are actually preserving those ne ne unnecessary struggles, right? And the right. truth of the matter is that, like, simplicity is not bad, actually. Simplicity is good. Medicare itself and Social Security also are relatively simple programs, certainly compared to the complicated mess of, like, Obamacare um, and even Medicaid. Um, and you know, you just turn a certain age and then you're eligible for it. Well, what if the age that you turned was one day old, right? right. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. There's a sort of liberal attachment. There's all of this means testing stuff, which became very, very popular starting in the sort of 1980s and really ramping up in the 1990s for the Democratic Party, has actually created a cultural phenomenon where liberals are like super attached to complexity. Um, and they actually are, in, in some way, they're actually putting up a smoke screen for um, working class people, where they're just saying, look, it's far more complex than you could ever possibly understand. We guarantee you we have your interests at heart. That's right. that at heart. That's why we have the program to begin with is because we care about you. But you can't possibly understand why we need to keep it so complicated because you're not an expert. You didn't right. go to college for that, probably because you didn't go to college. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's uh, bringing it all back home. That's And I think that's a great place to wrap. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to say or do you think we've covered everything? I think we've covered it all. This was a great conversation. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Megan. You, your your stuff is so good. I, I shared this piece as far and, and wide as I could, and I'm going to link to it again before we publish this this podcast. But uh, yeah, I mean, really, really fantastic work. I think all your stuff is great. But but this one really was like as soon as I read this, I emailed you as soon as I read it. I think I emailed you probably about 20 minutes after yeah. it was published. <laughs> like no, it came no, out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it came out. And I'm like, as soon as I got that, I'm like, I got to email Megan and, and, and ask if she would come back. So thank you so much for, for making the time. It's always great to talk to you. And you're always welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for having me.